Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So tonight we're going to be talking about the rights spouses have on each other. So the rights that a Muslim wife has on her husband and a husband has on her wife, on his wife. Um, so I'm going to start off with saying that we're doing this to further clarify. I know I said last week that we we're going to talk about rights of parents this week, but there were a lot of questions that came up in the question section uh, last week, and a lot of them had to do with rights that spouses have. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about that this week. Now, some of the topics, at least one of them, might be a little controversial, and I'm going to save that one to the end. So you may notice a right is missing from both the husband and the wife when I speak about them, but that one will be covered at the very end. So first, it's important to point out that marriage in, marriages in Islam are contracts between a husband and a wife. It's not like in Christianity where it's essentially God witnessing you being married and it's a sacrament or some kind of religious ritual. It's simply a contract. And like with all contracts, everyone has certain rights and responsibilities in order to fulfill their obligations under this contract. But what we have to underline all of our marriages with are three things, kindness, compassion, and respect. So if you don't respect your spouse, you're failing. If you don't have compassion for your spouse, you're failing. And if you're not kind to your spouse, you're failing. If you find that you're oftentimes kinder and more loving, more caring, more compassionate, more forgiving to people who are not your spouse, that's a problem because the number one person who you should be caring, kind, and respectful to is your spouse. Now, and that's what they deserve to begin with. So what are the rights that we have besides being kind to each other, having compassion, respect for each other? So the rights of a wife in Islam over her husband come in two forms. So one of them is gonna be financial, and then the other one is going to be non-financial rights. So. The financial rights that a wife has first start when the marriage is contracted. It's the mahar, right? So as everyone knows who's married, you have to give your wife something, right? It doesn't have to be cash. It could be gold, silver, property, animals, clothing, anything of value that makes sense for your situation. Now, when we say anything of value that makes sense for your situation, it's of someone of the same standing. So if you and your wife are both from significantly upper-class families, giving a mahar of $1,000 is probably not the standard among the people that you're from. But if the same token, if you know your future wife is a maid and you're a rickshaw puller in another country, a thousand US dollars might be too large of an amount for you to handle. So it's not based upon some set number that someone came up with. The mahar is based on one, what you agree upon. So the husband and wife come to an agreement that this is what the mahar is gonna be. And it should be based on what women of a similar status are given or what husbands of a similar status typically give their wives. So again, it's not necessarily, well, your wife's from a lower class, a lower socioeconomic status, so I'm going to give her less, even though I'm from, you know, let's say I'm a millionaire and my wife's from a middle-class family, then I should be giving her the equivalent of what I would give another millionaire. And in the same token, if you are from a middle-class family, you'll be giving a mahar that's more middle-class in standing. So you don't have to go give a million dollars to your future wife. No one's expecting that, unless of course you happen to be a millionaire or a billionaire, and then that might be what's expected of you. You're also required to spend on your wife. So a wife has a right to be spent on. And this is spent on a number of things, of course. Just as we covered with children, the, the father is responsible for all of the expenses of the children. A husband is responsive, responsible for all of the expenses of his wife. And it covers basic needs such as food, clothing, safe housing, uh, health care, things like that. Now, some scholars, and there's a difference of opinion on this, and I'm going to tell you right now, there are some scholars who will say that this financial support is contingent upon the wife fulfilling the husband's rights. And a lot of times you'll see it's rights when it comes to um, intimacy, or not intimacy, but intercourse specifically. 
That is not true. Your right is your right. So if you have a right that your husband spends on you, it doesn't matter if you violate your husband's rights. He doesn't get to take that out on you by saying, you didn't do what I said, now I'm not gonna spend on you. Because now not only do you violate his rights, he's now violating your rights. So if you're a sister, you have a right that your husband spends on you. If you're a brother, you have to spend on your wife. You have to buy her clothes. You have to buy her the things she needs within your means. So again, if you're extremely rich, that could be something like Gucci and Prada and driving a BMW or a Mercedes. If you're middle class, it could just be shopping at normal middle class stores. If you're not very wealthy, it could very well mean shopping at Goodwill. Although if you're wealthy, you can't send your wife to shop at Goodwill. You have to clothe her and feed her in the same manner you clothe and feed yourself and in the same manner you clothe and feed your kids. So no going to Michelin starred restaurants while you send your wife to KFC. That's not allowed. Now, also within the financial rights, you have to spend on her. She does not have to spend on you. You have to spend on your kids. Your wife does not have to spend on your kids. Even if your wife is the mother of your children, it's not from a past marriage, it's from your current marriage, your wife is not obligated to spend on the children. You're the one that's obligated to spend. So brothers, you have to spend your money. She doesn't have to spend hers. You cannot obligate or force her to spend her money. You can ask, and if she wants to increase your lifestyle, let's say you both work, you both make money, and you want to live a different lifestyle than you live off one income. Yes, your wife can willingly pro help provide for the family, but it is your job to provide for the family, not hers. So not only, again, does she have the right for you to spend on her, she has the right that you cannot touch her money or her property. And we have a number of hadiths when we talk about spending, such as take from his wealth on a reasonable basis, only what is sufficient for you and your children. That's in uh, both Bukhari and Muslim. You know, you have in Surat al-Talaq, let the rich man spend according to his means and let the man whose resources are restricted, let him spend according to what Allah has given him. That's summing up exactly the concept that we just talked about. A wife's also required, as we said, to have accommodation, safety, and security. And we get that from, again, sort of a talaq, where it says, lodge them where you dwell according to your means. Now, in that one, it's talking about divorced women, but in general, a wife has a right to have safe and secure accommodations and also to have safety and security. So you'll oftentimes hear scholars and others say that a woman's not allowed to travel overnight without her husband or another related male. And that's because your husband's required to provide security for you. So if you go somewhere where something could happen to you and your husband cannot guarantee your safety, well, if something happens to you, it's your husband's responsibility to have stopped that. So it's not fair that you're going to say, I'm going to go somewhere, I'm going to spend the night somewhere, I'm going to travel far, or you told me, hey, don't go out at night in this neighborhood, and you're going to do it anyway. And now your husband was who's responsible and has an obligation to you to provide you that safety and security no longer can because of a choice you've made. So because of this obligation, that's why men are generally able, husbands can tell their wives not to go to certain places, not to be out after a certain time, and not to travel without a related male relative. Now, when we get with non-financial rights, they have a right to fair treatment. So you cannot be mean to your wife. You have to respect them. And your wife is a very respectable person, and you should see them as an extension of yourself. Would you want to be treated the way you're treating them? So you should only treat them with kindness. Uh, and this is, of course, in Surat Nisa, you have part of uh, Ayah 19, and live with them honorably. You also have in Surat Al-Baqarah, and they have rights similar over that. Basically, you have rights over, basically, and they women have rights over their husbands, as regarding the living expenses, similar to those of their husbands over them as regards to obedience and respect to what is reasonable. Some of that's bracketed text, um, but in general, you have rights over your wife, your wife has rights over you, and they're, they're similar rights in the sense that you spend and treat them in the way you wish to be treated and you wish to spend on yourself. Um, you have, of course, a hadith, which is in Muslim and Bukhari, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, be kind to women. Of course, as we covered last week, the Prophet himself never 
hit a woman or a child. He was always kind to them, always patient. And that's when we come into not harming one's wife. So your wife has a right on you not to hurt her. So again, the whole idea that your wife has a right to safety and security, it's not just safety and security from others. Of course, as a husband, you need to protect your wife from others, but you also need to protect your wife from yourself. You have to control your anger. You should never say something to her that could hurt her feelings, especially out of anger. And in a lot of ways, when we get mad, we say things we don't mean. And you should try to restrain that. If you get mad, walk away. That's hard to do. I know it's hard to do, but it's what you should do. Because also husbands have a right not to be harmed as well. So you shouldn't abuse them verbally. You shouldn't say mean things. Look, you should be forgiving and have compassion. If your wife burns your food or if your wife doesn't cook something that you like or cook something you don't like or whatever the situation is, have some compassion. Don't go and say, oh my gosh, you ruined dinner. What will we eat? And just be mad about that. Don't do that. Laugh about it. Maybe get some takeout, make something else. But never be unkind toward your spouse. And that includes don't hit your spouse. You're not allowed to do that, which we'll, we'll cover a little later exactly the details on that as we did cover last week in the question section. But again, no harming them. Do not hurt their feelings. Do not reciprocate harm. You know, I mean, there's, for the brothers, there's even an instance where Amr radiallahu anhu was, uh, his wife was saying really mean things to him. <laughs> and someone said, well, how, how would you let her do this to you? You're the, you know, commander of the faithful. And he said, look, she's my wife. She does a lot for me. She gets some liberties. Have that attitude. So be kind to your wives. Now, speaking of wives, plural, if you do happen to live in a country that's not the United States, and you happen to find that polygamy is legal, you are obligated, and this is the right for all of your wives, to treat them completely equally. So if you buy wife number one a Mercedes, technically that means you're buying wife number two, three, and possibly four Mercedes completely equally in every way, sharing your time, what you buy them as gifts, everything. So if you're having trouble maintaining one wife in that way, chances are you can't have a second. It's not a, I want one, so I have one. It's you want one, there's a reason you can have one and you're able to actually fulfill the rights of this other person as well. Because remember, if you can't fulfill the, wives of, the rights of one wife, how are you going to fulfill the rights of two, three, or four wives? You won't be able to, especially with the added burden of having to treat them completely equally. So what rights do husbands have? We've just mentioned that husbands have to provide security, safety, food, clothing, health care, expenses of every kind. They have to be kind to their wives. They have to be respectful to their wife. They have to be compassionate with their wife. So husbands also have a right to kindness, compassion, mercy, but they also have some rights on their wife. For instance, your wife, well, yes, you have to spend on them and you can't spend their money without their permission, of course. They have to safeguard your money and your property. So there's a difference between your wife saying, I need something, okay, I'm gonna take the money and go buy it. And your wife deciding to go on a shopping spree at a luxury goods store for things she already has and just wasting money. So your wife safeguards your money and your property, making sure that no harm comes to your property. So no breaking things intentionally, making sure things are kept up and that your money is safe. So, and we'll get to that, what that actually means in a little bit. It doesn't mean that your wife has to clean your house. It just means she has to make sure it's safe and nothing's happening to it. Now, we talk about the obligation of obedience, which we talked about before. Um, in Surat Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in an interpreted meaning says, men are their protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has made one of them to excel, or excel the other and because they spend from their means. That's, of course, commanding men to spend to support their wife. And it's also saying that when they're talking about excel one another, it's sexual dimorphism. So men are typically larger and stronger than women and more able to protect women than, I mean, now, nowadays that's not always the truth, but in the past it was, and even, even today it is. I mean, if you go somewhere with your husband, you may notice that you're treated a little bit differently than if you were there by yourself. 
that's part of the protection that comes from that. People are also, everyone's probably heard the, the story of you go to an auto, um, a mechanic, and if the husband's there, they don't really try to sell you too many things. But if it's the wife by herself, suddenly they're like, oh, you know, you need to get this fixed. And if you're, if you say, no, I don't, I know what I'm talking about. They go, where's your husband or something like that. People do get disrespectful toward women um, because they feel like they can in a lot of ways. They get condescending, mansplaining, all of that things that we don't really need in society. Now, this also means when we're talking about obedience for safety and obedience, again, just to clarify again, the obligation of obedience, it's not just because they spend on you, it's because they have the duty to keep you safe. So how can someone keep you safe if you don't have to listen to them? Because then you could say, you know what, it's two in the morning and I'm gonna go take a walk in Dutchtown in St. Louis, or I'm gonna go walk in a bad neighborhood I don't care. I like walking at night and that's the neighborhood I want to walk in. Something happens to you. Well, your husband was responsible for your safety. Now you're injured or something worse has happened to you. That's not really a fair thing. Um, so you're not also allowed to admit anyone your husband dislikes to the house. Um, and that's in general. So if you know there's someone your husband doesn't like, they're not allowed to be admitted to the house. Again, that's just a respect thing. Um, also, there may be a reason that your husband does not like this person. And it could be something about this person's dangerous or something you don't know about them that they do know. There's a difference of opinion on this. There's some scholars that'll say that women are not allowed to leave the house without their husband's permission. And again, that goes to that safety issue. Um, that's a little bit on the, um, the far end of it. Of course, women can leave their house to go about whatever they need to do. If they work, go to school, doing household tasks, whatever it is that they need to do to leave the house, of course they can leave the house. However, if your husband says, hey, you can't leave the house after midnight, it's not safe. Obviously then the whole idea that your husband has the right to, well, has the obligation to protect you. So they have the ability to tell you no to that. Then we get to discipline. You'll hear this a lot. And this is one of the topics we're gonna take a little bit of time on. And we talked about it last week a bit too. You're not allowed to beat your wife. I'm going to say it two more times. You're not allowed to beat your wife. You're not allowed to beat your wife. So even though you'll hear hadith and ayah in the Quran, for instance, in Surah Nisa, when it says, as to those women whose part you see, who, on whose part you see ill conduct, admonish them first, then refuse to share their beds, and last, beat them lightly. What it's referring to, I don't have one with me. They're referring to taking a siwak or a miswak and in your hand, it's a flick of a wrist for a tap. And that would be like the absolute most you could ever do. The prophet didn't do that. He didn't beat women. He never hit women, never hit children. So if we follow the prophetic example, you don't do that. If you follow what is absolutely permissible, and what I mean by absolutely permissible is in the sense of saying like the bare minimum, the limit, how far can you go without committing a sin? Then that would be it. And it's just a tap, essentially like this with a little stick. Um, you can't leave bruises. You can't hit faces. You can't leave cuts. You can't break bones. You can't do any of that stuff. You're also not supposed to insult people. Because remember, one of the rights all Muslims have when we cover the sins of the tongue is that they should be safe from your tongue and from your hands. If a stranger or someone else you meet is safe from your tongue and your hands, then of course your wife has more of a right to be safe from your tongue and hands. So you cannot beat your wife. We'll cover a little later when we say, okay, my wife's not listening to me. She's doing haram things or she's not fulfilling my rights. What do I do? Same thing with husbands. What do you do? You can't beat them. And beating never helped anyone because again, even if you don't physically hurt them, you're probably gonna psychologically hurt the person that you beat. So you're causing harm and harm is not allowed to be caused to another Muslim. Again, with respect, um, wives are supposed to treat their husbands in a good manner, just as husbands are supposed to treat their wives in a good manner. That's one of the rights that both have. Now, if you go on a place like IslamQA.info or a lot of places, you'll find that they'll say things like the wife serving her husband. It's an obligation. And they'll quote Ibn Tamiya. A lot of places quote Ibn Tamiya on this. And this is kind of funny in a way because they would say that, you know, 
it varies according to circumstance. You know, a Bedouin woman serves her husband one way, a town, a town dweller another way. You know, rich women would serve their husbands in other ways than poor women. So women, you have to serve your husbands according to, you know, your class and grouping of people and what's normal for you. That's not necessarily true. And you don't really find that anywhere in any Hadith. Again, they're quoting a scholar, but they're not quoting the Hadith of the Quran. They're quoting what might essentially just be culture that has seeped into Islam rather than fact. So you'll see that they'll say sometimes you have to take care of the house, cooking, other things. And if we go to, again, what is absolutely permissible without falling into sin, here we go. Sisters, you're not required to do anything. You're required to fulfill the rights of your husband. You're not required to pay for things. You're not required to cook. You're not required to clean. You're not required to do any of that. Notice what I'm saying, not required to do that. Now, unless your husband and you are from a socioeconomic status or a culture where typically maids and cooks and other people are employed, and it's not customary that if you, for instance, if you don't work and you stay home all day, could you kick your feet up on the couch and walk and do whatever you wanted? Relax all day? Absolutely. That would be halal for you to do. But you should, of course, if you're home by yourself or home with the kids, cooking, cleaning, doing the supporting tasks, especially if your husband is out working, that would be more fair and more equitable than just simply staying at home and not doing any of those things. But again, you're not required. But what's better is that you do. Just as what's Husbands are not required to come home if they have a, a spouse that stays home all day and clean or help with cooking. But the Prophet did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so we should too. So brothers, help your wives. Help them in the kitchen. Help them clean. Help them with other things. And sisters, please help. Help your, help your husbands out cooking and cleaning and those things. If you both work, which is the tragedy of nowadays, I'm not saying that it's a tragedy because women shouldn't be given economic opportunity. I'm saying it's a tragedy that, you know, nowadays we have to have two income households in many cases to just get by. Um, and that's the economic situation of the Western world. So in that case, split the duties. Brothers, don't, don't play this game where you work eight hours a day, your wife works eight hours a day, and then you come home and start playing Xbox or go hang out with the brothers while your wife comes home and cooks and cleans. That's not okay. If you're both working, you both should be splitting the household duties. If one of you is working and the other isn't, the one who isn't, that should be their job is taking care of the household. But again, it's not an obligation on the sisters to do that. I'm sure someone there is like, why are you telling them this? But again, that's not an obligation. Now, this next one, this is the more controversial one. And you know, some people would say saying that sisters don't have to cook and clean is controversial. It's not. That's pretty standardly known. Um, and then they're voluntarily helping, helps their husbands to do good deeds, helps their husband to work and fulfill their obligations. So they're getting the reward for that too. Um, not beating your spouse. For some people, that's controversial. It shouldn't be. If I can't go hit someone on the street, obviously I can't hit my spouse. If you get angry a lot, walk away. If you can't stop yourself from hitting your spouse, maybe you should get a divorce. Maybe you're not cut out to be a husband because you're going to commit sins and you're going to incur sin every time you do that. You're oppressing your spouse. You're committing an injustice. It's not allowed. And speaking of that, we're going to talk about the last right that we're going to talk that we have tonight. And that's the right to mutual pleasure, gratification. Each spouse, not just the husband, is supposed to make themselves available to the other for gratification, pleasure, sexual intercourse. And remember, if the husband has a right to pleasure and the wife has a right to pleasure, that's right, brothers, your wife has a right to also receive pleasure too from you. That brings up the next question. You'll oftentimes hear people quote this hadith where it says the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said when a man calls his wife to his bed and she refuses, and he went to sleep angry with her, the angels will curse her until morning. It's in Bukhari and it's in Muslim. So a lot of men then go and say, well, it must be such a great sin if my wife isn't fasting or sick 
or on her menstrual cycle or something for her to refuse me. Therefore, wouldn't it be better if I just, I just forced myself on her? It's what I want, it's my right, I have a right to her. Well, yes, you do have a right to your wife, but your wife also has a right on you. First, they have a right to safety and you forcing yourself on them is not making them safe. You're gonna harm them physically, you're going to harm them emotionally, you're gonna hurt their mental health. Also, again, they have a right not to have that happen to them. So great, you've just violated all of those rights, but you've also violated another right. Your wife also has a right to pleasure, just like you do. So you might be thinking, I have a right to this, I'm gonna take my right. If you take your right and violate the right of another, that's even worse. That's another form of oppression. It's almost like if I said, oh, you know, this brother over here owes me money, so I'm gonna go beat him up and take the money because I know he has it in his pocket right now. He owes it to me, it's mine. You wouldn't do that. I mean, if you did, that would definitely be a crime. So you'll oftentimes hear some scholars and one of the people I learned from Bilal Phillips, he's been quoted to as saying that marital rape does not exist in Islam. There's a nuance to that. Does it exist in the sense like any other hudud punishment, like you know, murder, rape, those kinds of things where if you have witnesses, you go to a court, they'll get punished? No, you don't clearly find any text that says that this specific crime exists as a crime. But like many things that are halal and haram, we get it from implied sources. So again, if a wife and a husband both have a right to the same thing, you can't take this and then harm the other person. Okay, harming them is haram. You can't do it. Oppressing them is haram. You can't do it. They have a right to pleasure too. You're not fulfilling that right. You've also committed something haram. So there must be consent in Islam because obviously if you're not consenting to something, you're probably not enjoying it. And both the husband and a right, wife have a right to enjoy it and to enjoy each other. Um, and that's a very important thing that we're going to end on is, again, fulfilling rights. Now, what if your rights aren't being fulfilled? So brothers, instead of going and taking your right, or sisters, instead of going and saying, you know, oh, my husband's hiding the money, what do I do? Well, in the case of money, the money that's meant to be spent on you, that's your money. So you can take it from your husband's account and spend it. Most scholars agree on that, that if your husband has money, he's not giving it to you and the kids to spend on, you can take it and spend it. There's hadith that cover this one. What if your wife's not listening to you? That's supposed to beat her up. So what do you do? And honestly, beating someone up is never going to make them listen to you in the first place. So that's obviously something you shouldn't do. You know, your wife is refusing you every time you come to her. Well, let's talk about it. First thing you should do is talk to her. Hey, why do you keep going out after midnight and going for walks? You know, or can I join you to make sure you're safe? If your wife is denying you when you call her to your bed, ask her why. It could simply be something like a medical issue. And if you were to just go take it, you know, go and be like, I, this is my right, you could cause her more harm. So why don't you go and find out what it is? Now, if you find out it's nothing, she's just saying, no, I don't want to. And it's night after night, after night, after night, after night. And this issue is such a big deal for you that you feel like you should be a violent person and go after her. Get a divorce, talk to someone, talk to a counselor, try to find out if there's an issue that can be resolved. If an issue can't be resolved, get a divorce. What would you rather be? A violent person who terrorizes your spouse or someone who can go find a new spouse who maybe will fulfill that right that you feel so entitled to. And you are, it is your right, but you can find someone else who will fulfill it. And that's the correct thing to do in that case. In the case of a husband that's not spending on his wife and kids and is refusing to, again, talk it over with them. Talk it over with people who can help. If it's their family that can help, your family that can help, a marriage counselor that can help, a trusted person in the community who's knowledgeable about the religion and can help, go talk to them. And if you can't resolve the issue, get a divorce. Your rights aren't being fulfilled. So your two choices at that point, if there's an impasse and there's no way to get your rights fulfilled, whether it's a financial right, a physical right, a safety right, whatever it is, a respect even, if you can't resolve it by talking to your spouse, trying to work things out, and this right is something you're not willing to give up or not willing to waive, get a divorce. So 
with waiving rights, and this is the last thing, I promise, I'm not gonna go too late tonight. With waiving rights, we'll all, you'll often hear the question, what if my wife massively out earns me or she makes more than me? Shouldn't she have to pay? The answer is no, you still have to pay. Could she contribute? So for instance, if you make 60,000 a year and she makes 400,000 a year, and you know, mashallah, she's doing well as an anesthesiologist, let's say, and you're doing entry-level IT help desk work. Um, she could contribute because she wants to live in a bigger house. She could say, look, I'm gonna give my money too. We'll pool our money, we'll buy our big house, we'll maintain the lifestyle we want. But hey, at any time she could say, my money is my money, sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to contribute this anymore because that's also her right. But what if, you know, you don't want to pay for childcare. You want to stay at home parent. Could the husband stay at home and the wife work? So most scholars would say, no, the husband is required to provide. But again, it's your right. You can waive a right. You could say, Hey, I'm going to go ahead and stay home. You work, whatever you want to do. I would advise against that simply because there isn't any instances we have of any hadith or any ayah from the Quran that indicate that you can be a stay-at-home dad. But again, what couples work out within their own marriage that works for them and isn't haram, that's on them. Finally, on this one, if you do get divorced, because I've mentioned divorce a couple of times. One, I am not someone that says, get divorced, divorce, divorce, divorce. No, I would say that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hates divorce. We know that. He has said that we all should hate divorce, but if it needs to happen because it's the resort you need to go to, go for it. Don't stay in a marriage where you're being abused. Don't stay in a marriage where you're feeling like you're going to abuse someone. But if you do get divorced, remember, the husband is required to provide maintenance for his ex-wife and for his children. He's responsible for that. Do not, do not, brothers, let a court force your wife to pay you alimony. Turn it down. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know what the process is of saying, I don't want alimony, but one, do not pursue it. Do not accept it. If it's forced on you, give it back to her, you know, whatever you need to do, because you're not entitled to that money. Child support? Look, if your wife wants to give money to pay for the, her kids, that's fine, but it's your obligation. Do not let a court force your wife to pay child support. And for you, make sure you pay maintenance to your spouse, or your ex-spouse and make sure you take care of your kids. If the state's having to come to take money from you to pay for your kids, you're not meeting the obligation toward your kids. If the state's having to come to get alimony from you, it's the same thing. I understand too, that in order for children to get benefits, certain benefits from the state, like insurance benefits, in many cases, you have to pay child support. So it's not the state coming after you, it's more, it's just what has to happen. But don't stop there. The state tells you, you gotta pay $100 a month, $200 a month, $300 a month but you would normally have paid 1500, add the additional amount in and give it to your ex-spouse if they have custody. If you have custody, continue paying for your kids because that's your obligation.